All right, welcome back to the Crossway Community Church membership class. We are on clip two. We're going to move forward in the material. And today we are going to talk about why join a church. So in the last one, uh, Kirk made a quick statement about uh, we, we believe that all followers of Jesus are called to be members of local churches. Uh, not only is it a, a duty, a responsibility for us, but a great privilege to, to be a part of a local church. Uh, so we want to kind of build out a kind of a theological um, foundation for that today. Uh, so if you can see there on the screen, uh, we kind of want to fill out this sentence, the role of the local church in the Christian life. Uh, or actually, no, go down. The That's a subtitle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I meant to go down farther. Uh, the local church is so close to the heart of God in his plan for the Christian life that blank. And we hope that you'll see that uh, that all God's people are called to be full functioning members of a local church with joy, sacri sacrificially, and uh, that's right at the heart of God. So we're going to walk through uh, just this first section today, why join a church. Uh, but to start it out, let's go with this number one. Uh, we're going to have uh, one of us will read it and then just give some thoughts on on the passage, uh, particularly towards this topic. So the first one, Kirk, you can take. Uh, I'm from Galatians, uh, especially looking at the church universal and churches local. Yeah. Uh, so these two verses, Galatians 1, 2, and all the brothers who are with me, Paul talking, to the churches of Galatia. And then verse 13, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And so in these verses, we see, you'll notice you'll see two distinct uses of the word church. So on the one hand, in this first verse, we have churches plural of Galatia. So there, Paul seems to be assuming this word church, that just means assembly, that there are assemblies of, of believers across Galatia. There are multiple different local assemblies of these believers across the area. Galatia would be a region. And then um, in the second passage, Paul talks about his former life when he was persecuting the church, but there he uses it in the singular. I persecuted the church. Um, even though he was going after Christians who presumably would have belonged to, you know, different uh, uh, people from different areas, um, he was nonetheless, he can nonetheless speak of it as a singular reality. And so this is what theologians sometimes call the distinction between the local church and the global church, or uh, sometimes people say the capital C church, the universal church, and the lowercase c churches, uh, the the local churches. Would you add anything to that? Mm -hmm. No, I, no, I, I think that's good. The what I, the couple things I've always uh, thought about on these these two passages here. One is that he says it in the very same breath, like that's still the same chapter of Galatians. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, it's within a matter of a like couple 11, sentences, 10 verses you know, each other. Uh, that he's making this distinction. Um, but also, I think this, when he uses the singular, the church that he persecuted, uh, that was not even in the same city. It wasn't in the region of Galatia. That was, Paul was on his way to Damascus, mm -hmm. what he's talking about there specifically, um, most likely. Um, but he was also persecuting the, the church in Jerusalem. Not necessarily in Galatia. It hadn't really spread to that point mm -hmm. in terms of as you follow the book of Acts. Um, so, yeah, he's con he's considering everywhere the church goes is the church, and yet there's multiple local churches. Why don't you give us your analogy with the, the football, the NFL? I, I always thought that one was helpful. Yeah, so sometimes I like to explain uh, the relationship between the local and universal church this way. Like, if I... Uh, came up to you and I said, I am in the NFL. Um, first of all, you might be surprised because I'm not a terribly large individual. Um, but if I said I'm in the NFL and I tried to convince you of that, you a, a reasonable question you might ask me is, well, what team are you on? What, what roster are you on? And if I said to you, well, I'm not actually on any of the 32 teams. I'm not on any of their rosters. I'm just... Uh, let's say like a free agent or something. Um, you might say, well, you're not, I don't think you're really in the NFL then, Kirk, uh, because the way we understand the NFL is the NFL, those who are part of the NFL, it's composed of those 32 teams. It's composed of those 
who are on the roster of those teams. And so similarly, when theologians, sometimes you'll hear folks say, well, I'm not a part of a local church, but I'm a part of the universal church. That's never how those terms were meant to be used as theologians have use those terms and reflect it on those categories that we find in scripture. It was never meant to be like this universal church is this vague, undefined thing that doesn't actually show up in real life, um, that you can just claim to be a part of it. And there's no actual manifestation in terms of a local gathering. Yes, if you are a believer, you are a part of the universal church and being a part of a local church doesn't make you saved. Yes, that part of it is correct. But uh, according to scripture, every believer... Um, except for very abnormal circumstances, would be a part of a local church. And so um, just like I might say, if I'm a part of the NFL, it means I, you would know that because I can show you what roster I'm on. In a similar way, the, the universal church manifests itself and is giving concrete expression in all the particular local churches across the globe, the global church. Um, mm -hmm. And so similarly, mm -hmm. if we are part of the universal church, we would, we would choose to uh, assemble ourselves with a particular expression of that global church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. So that that's uh, good for that section. Let's move on. Um, now, when we move to this next part, as we talk about God's view of the local church, we, we're going to focus on the church broadly, but the local churches, that's the way we wanted to be thinking about this, because we're talking about why join a local church. The first section is just demonstrating that there were local churches in early church and now we're talking about how does God view each local church so we'll read each passage and then ask the question what does this passage help give us a vision uh, or an understanding of how God views the church so uh, I'll take the Ephesians passage here uh, it says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he may might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. All right, so the question, how does this passage help us understand God's view of the local church? If I could just sum this one up simply, I would just say God's absolutely crazy about mm -hmm. the local church. I mean, here you have this picture of Jesus uh, is the husband and the church is his bride and just such affectionate serving loving language uh, he, he uh, gives himself up for the church he cleanses the church he nourishes the church he wants to present the church to himself holy and blameless mm -hmm. that's just a beautiful picture uh, we also see that uh, the very institution of marriage was actually set up so that it would always tell us that this is how Christ views the church and sometimes we see that in a positive example when a husband is tenderly caring for his wife and serving her uh, and sometimes we see it in a negative example when a husband's not doing that we can look at that and say christ would never treat his bride that way uh, but uh, it's a beautiful picture i think in terms of how god thinks about the local church right and you see the um what's interesting too about that mystery about how marriage reflects the relationship of christ to his church it's as if he's saying it's not so much uh, that Paul saw marriage and was like, you know what, that would be a good analogy, but mm -hmm. that it was actually a mystery that all along God, in a, in a sense, designed marriage, which of course serves other functions, but one of its function um, is to show and to display that relationship. And this is a theme we see all throughout Scripture, right? The marriage in Revelation of the of the marriage of the supper of the Lamb, and um, this beautiful picture where um, even in the Old Testament, God speaks of Israel in this, this sort of covenant language with mm -hmm. Israel, even as an unfaithful wife. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beautiful things too here is we see the display of God's love for the church in uh, the costliness of his sacrifice for her and in, in dying for her in, in providing for her and nourishing her and cleansing her. But even the fact that sometimes we might struggle to love other believers because we find them to be unlovable, we find them to be annoying or we find them to be difficult but what we see here is that Christ 
um, his example of love for the church is notwithstanding those things. It's not that Christ loves the church because the church has qualities in and of itself that make it lovable in the sense that the church is righteous and the church is deserving of all these graces, but by nature of it being grace, it is undeserved. Christ is loving a people that was not initially loving him. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it it teaches us a, a similar view of the church as well. Yeah. Yeah, great. So we'll move on to the next passage. But one other thing we can ask, because we'll ask it at the end of this clip, um, is, is this my view of the church? Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at how God views the church, but obviously we want our heart to beat to the same drum that God's heart beats to. So we're going to ask that question at the end. Do we view the local church that we are a part of the same way that Jesus thinks of that church? Mm -hmm. So if you could take us to the Acts passage in the 1 Corinthians one. Yeah, Acts 9. uh, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And so what, what's interesting in these passages, it's, it's, in, it's in the Acts passage itself assumed, but it even comes out clearly when you read it in light of Act, or 1 Corinthians 15, is that Paul is he's going after, um, as it says, men and women, people who belong to the way. This idea of uh, a way was a way of talking about Christians, uh, followers of Jesus, those who believed in Christ. And yet when Jesus arrests him and confronts him on the road to Damascus, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me, I am Jesus. I'm the one whom you are persecuting, which is what and then Paul, when he talks about how his his act of persecuting, he says, I persecuted the church. And so Jesus, in other words, how does how does God view the church? Well, Jesus so identifies himself with the church um, that that to persecute the church is to persecute him. Um, you don't mess with the church. If you mess with the church, you mess with with him, Jesus says. Mm-hmm. It really goes like along with that uh, kind of the picture of Jesus being the head and the church being the body and built together. Mm-hmm. Like, like if if somebody like cut off my finger or something like that, and I was like, why why are you messing with me? Right? right. They wouldn't say like, no, I'm not messing with you. I'm just messing with your finger, man. <laughs> like, no, like you, <laughs> like that's part of me. Like right. that's so it really goes along with that picture. Good. You ready to move on? Yep. All right. Uh, so this is the First Timothy, Acts, and Matthew. First uh, Timothy three. If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Acts twenty. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which He obtained with His own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, All right, so we'll just walk through these a little bit and kind of put it together. Uh, So how does God view the church? In the first one, uh, we see uh, that it says that the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So it gives the picture of the house, like the very family. Uh, it's the family of God. Uh, it's the people. The people are the family of God. They are the household. It's not a building. It's not some structure, but it's the pil- the, the people mm-hmm. themselves. So like one of the ways we make this distinction in our home, and I know you make a distinction similar, uh, like we, we don't say like we're going to church on Sunday. We, we try to tell our kids we're going to service to be with the church, to let, let them know that we are the church as the people and the church is gathering together, whether that be at a park or a building or a home, it, it, that, that doesn't, doesn't matter. The church is the people of God. Mm. Uh, the Acts passage, what I find funny too here is uh, as a side, and anytime we do these 
Kirk always gets on me for not making noises with the table. <laughs> <laughs> this table is squeaky. And he's always squeaking the table. Uh, do as do as he says, not as he does, I guess. All right. Anyways, next <laughs> the, the passage, right. Acts twenty. <laughs> so that's the household, the household. And, and and the people there. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. God has given uh, the task of being the the pillar and buttress of the truth. Not that it depends on them, but God works through them as the agency to uphold the truth. The Acts passage uh, has two things to worth noting. Um, one that it's the flock of God, and so if, when we think of the flock, when we think of lambs, sheep, uh, they're they're dumb animals. They're they're not very smart. Uh, they're very vulnerable. If you see a lamb who has wandered away from the shepherd and walked away from the flock, it's it's in trouble. It's going to be dinner for a wolf. Uh, so it's a very weak people is the picture, and a very foolish people, and they need a shepherd to care for them. Uh, so. Um, you also have this picture in the same passage that or that he obtained with his own blood, uh, which just it's that's obviously the blood of Jesus. Uh, but I believe that uh, as Paul is saying that he's he's demonstrating that this is very this flock is very near and dear to the heart of God, mm-hmm. even so much that he gave his only son mm-hmm. to die on her behalf. Like this is the apple of God's eye, mm-hmm. as we read about Israel in the Old Testament, right? Uh, so it's a very uh, people that are very close to God's heart, uh, and yet they're very foolish and weak. And yet, this Matthew passage, Jesus tells Peter that the church, uh, God, Jesus will build his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's a very weak people, but even hell itself cannot prevail against it. Why? Because Jesus is the chief shepherd of the church, and he mm-hmm. will he will guard it, he will protect it. Yeah. Yeah, I would say too, um, like... I'm struck by even in that first Timothy passage to calling the church the pillar and buttress of the truth as well. Like uh, we oftentimes in our culture where there's all these different truth claims going on and even skepticism about whether we can know truth. And, and God says that he's actually established his church as this place where he speaks elsewhere of like the gospel being deposited and given to the church. Um, that the church is meant to be this place that holds up the truth. And it's a place where, where God is treasuring and preserving his truth through the ages, uh, this testimony to the gospel. Acts 20, this passage where God so cares for the church that he actually, that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit is actually orchestrating its organization, it's appointing leaders and um, that the church would be cared for. Yeah, so just powerful pictures of God's care for the church and with that Matthew mm-hmm. 16 passage like he's even, even as you see throughout the book of Acts like nothing is going to stop his mission mm-hmm. from going forward he's going to protect his people he's going to uh, build his church like he's he's going to make sure things succeed yeah good all right squeaky you ready yeah <laughs> <laughs> gotta yeah, so. got add some WD uh, 40 to this table yeah. so we've seen that uh, Jesus is crazy about his bride is very, his very people he self-identifies like they to mess with the church is to mess with Jesus. It's the household of God. It's his bride. His bride is a precious flock. Um, vulnerable yeah. people. On to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here we get to the, towards the end of the book of Revelation, where we're starting to see the culmination of many of of the the threads throughout the book. And we get this this final uh, consummation of this marriage, uh, celebrated and almost like... uh, a reception, you might think of it, this 
this this this celebration of the marriage between Christ and his bride. And so obviously the church being that bride, this passage, just the, the splendor, you have a great multitude, you have a roar of waters, peals of thunder, all this stuff. What is all this excitement? What is all this noise pointing towards? It's pointing towards just the celebration of the relationship God has with his people. It shows us the heart of God, that how much he cares for his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a scene you want to enter, not simply just read it, right? Um, but really just experience it. Truly, really, I mean, the way he writes it, he's like, there seemed to be the voice of a great multitude and the roar of many waters. So I, you know, I try to think of Niagara Falls, the, the, the sound, yeah. yeah. And like, that's, these people are, they're what not are they screaming, going, they're yeah. cheering. What are they going crazy yeah. about, though? Yeah. Hallelujah. Because yeah. Almost no. like if you entered a stadium and you heard a yeah. roar. Yeah. And what are they cheering about? Not a touchdown, yeah. but, it, you yeah. know, like the roar of heaven is cheering That's over right. the relationship he has. The bride is coming established in. with his That Jesus bride. has prepared her for. So it's, yeah. a, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, you know, I, I think if, you, if you've ever been to a wedding where you see uh, a man that is just crazy about what's about to happen it's just, it's just a wonderful picture i know i can say it myself I, I remember i don't know if you remember standing in front of the aisle i it, yeah. it's, it's hard to it's hard to forget it yeah you can't yeah. you just can't put words on it the anticipation and the waiting and uh i mean i feel like that those those moments right before for for myself as danica finally made it to the doors i felt like that just took forever yeah. Like those moments where the you're waiting, and once that door opens, it's just your heart sings, just yeah. absolutely sings. There is my bride coming in, and once again, you just see the picture of Jesus, absolutely crazy about the local church. Now, obviously, we don't always experience that. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say, you know, I'm a pastor, you're a pastor. I I can't say I think about the church like that all the time. So, uh, so we're this next question. We're going to assume that we don't always view the church this way. Um, that is difficult. There's hurdles. Yes. And so the question is, why, why do we think it's difficult uh, to regularly enjoy and express this this very exalted view of the church? So what has contributed to our view of the church? Maybe there's a bad experience or we've never just, you know, maybe just never thought about it like this. What, what do you think are some reasons why we don't, uh, as the people of God, think about the church in the same way that Jesus does? Yeah. Um, just trying to go off of maybe a couple different ideas for all of us. It'll, it'll probably be a little bit different, but it may be, like you said, that we've had a bad experience. Maybe I, I you, it's probably not uncommon for us to in interact with folks. Folks, maybe this is you, maybe you've met someone who doesn't want anything to do with the church because of a particular impression they have of the church based on a bad experience they've had. Or maybe it's just, maybe it's not a bad experience. Maybe it's just the church doesn't seem all that important. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the church is just maybe like maybe at best it's something you know you'd like your kids to go to so they can kind of inherit a sense of morality, you know, or you know, or go kind of go through the motions you did as a kid. Um, it's just not prioritized. Mm -hmm. It competes with sports on Sundays. It competes with your time and your and your concerns mm -hmm. throughout the week. Um, but like when you go to scripture, especially Revelation, which is this unveiling of the actual. Um, what reality actually looks like the church is at the center of God's plan and his mission in this world and so I don't I don't think we oftentimes work from the assumption that this this odd group of people who have a lot of mm -hmm. problems um, is actually at the very heart of what God is doing in this world yeah 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 I think yeah, I think you hit, hit those right right in the heart of I think some of the major things I do think uh, I mean if you think about the last couple of years of your life who who have been the people that you've had most you know, you've been impatient towards or frustrated with or, you know, had an argument with in your life besides me. <laughs> oh, you're asking me? Yeah. Particularly? I mean, oftentimes it's your family. Yeah, yeah. right. Because you, you're living with fellow sinners, right? And yeah. so that's just what it is. And I think, you know, sometimes what we would want is if the more you get involved in local church, maybe those problems will go away. But in fact, what you'll discover is people you're going to experience the church as a messy people. Yeah, because you're right? kind of leaning into it even more. Yeah, so you'll be sinned against. Uh, you'll do some of the biting at times. People will make decisions you don't agree with. Uh, it's just not as neat and clean as we mm -hmm. would like. And so um, it, it, those all those things can become very easy when you're not thinking of the church this way as this is my family. It's, it's just like, oh, well, it's just another, I don't like that kind of ketchup anymore. I'll go, I'll about, go by hunts instead of heinz or something mm -hmm. consumeristic but, yeah yeah um 
Yeah, it's sure. like, as especially when you're talking about, we have to remember that the church is there's this there's this tension as we have between the already and not yet. We have the the not yet with this grand vision of what the church ultimately will be, and we also have the not yet reality of that we are um, the gospel is a gospel that saves sinners. So it's not, as you said, I didn't call, come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. And so we expect the community of the church to be a bunch of broken people. Um, we should expect the church, we shouldn't, in other words, be scandalized when the church has uh, has folks in it who have problems and is messy. That's, that's the nature of what the gospel is doing. It's saving people who have a bunch of problems. Um, as someone said in a pithy way, um, the church isn't a museum of the righteous, but a hospital for uh, those who mm-hmm. are sick. Mm-hmm. And so that that also helps our expectations yeah. to say, like, well, look, this is a place where God is working on people. Um, his grace is at work in their life. Yeah, yeah, and he does it delightfully to care for his bride. Just, yeah. It's great. I think we can wrap up there. I would want to encourage you, if you're listening, to uh, ask that same question of yourself and kind of think through, you know, what, what does make it difficult for you to view the t- church the local church the same way that jesus does who's absolutely crazy for the local church and then also that last question what is one thing you can do to move towards god's view of the local church uh, just to th- kind of throw out a quick couple ideas uh you know there's resources uh, books you could you can get a hold of we could certainly recommend to you short ones long ones articles sermons definitely a lot of resources out there um it's always good to talk to somebody that you think actually has a strong love for the local church and kind of find out the process, how that happened, uh, as well as I, th- I think probably the, the most profound one that we should do is ask God to give us the very same heart for mm-hmm. his people that, that he has. And so um, why don't we wrap up yeah. uh, by doing that very thing? And maybe yeah. maybe you could pray for us. Let, let me make, say one thing before that. Too. Eh, eh, no. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that the reason, I just want to orient, like the reason we're talking about all this again as in a, in a membership class is because part of, part of the process of membership is that we want to convey the value. We want to help unfold the value in scripture of the church that would compel us to say, I need to be a part of this. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's ultimately where kind of why we're going through all this material in a membership class is to, is to show the compelling vision of what is actually happening in the church and that we would want to be a part of it. But yes, I will close in prayer as well for us. God, we do ask, um, for your grace. So ultimately if we are going to have a view of the church that anywhere in any respect resembles your own. Um, it is only going to be by your spirit opening our, our the eyes of our heart, as Paul says, to be able to grasp these things. And so we would ask for all those, for Dan and I, as well as all those who would happen to listen to this video, even in the future, that this prayer would extend to, that you would, you would meet this prayer um, for those folks right now as they're watching this, um, that you would just through the time in your word that you would do a miraculous supernatural work mm-hmm. of, of just intervening in the, as, in the eyes of their heart, as, as Paul says, um, just to awaken them and increasingly show them your love and your grace and just the splendor of what you're doing in the church, um, even overcoming the the difficulties that we might experience, that 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 your that your revelation, what you've declared about the church, that your love for the church would would trump any um, any hurdles that we ourselves might carry. And so we pray all these things in the name of Christ, who promises to accomplish this mission in your people in the new covenant. Amen. Amen.